name is Boris. Um, I work at SUSE and uh, I do a little bit of stuff in the kernel here and there, mostly low level stuff, x86. And I'm going to try to explain what oopsies are and how, uh, what all the. Like this? Better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, what they are and what all the lines say, and uh, yeah, so feel free, feel free to ask questions because I don't know what what is in the, what is clear and what is not clear. So yeah, let's go. Yeah, the Linux kernel is enormous. I mean, <laughs> there are so many people writing for it and writing stuff for it, so uh, it grows by the minute and uh, can be very easily disturbed <laughs> and gets cranky and and and, and generates uh, oops and stops working. I just did a measurement. There's this tool called C lines of code, and you can measure how big the uh, how uh, how big a directory is. And it says uh, underneath, like only lines of code 11.7 .7 million. Uh, if you add the comments and the blank lines, that's something about I don't know 16 million or something. And it, this is two, this is 311, and uh, every merge window gets 10,000 patches. That's every three months, so you can imagine the growth, the rate of growth. Right. And if you see oopses, what do you need to know? Yeah. Well, uh, Linus says the main trick is having five years of experience with, with oopses, and this is. Uh, Recursive like GNU, so GNU is not Unix. I mean, how do you how do you understand an oops? Well, you have to have experience, <laughs> at least five years. And um, well, the, uh, oh, <laughs> the the good thing about it is uh, oops is uh, I mean they're documented here and there. There's a there's a there's even a file in the kernel source tree that explains how to approach those. So yeah, I mean, information is on the internet, but but it is hard to understand what's there. I mean, it's not like trivial, right? So you can start from this file, for example, and bring a lot of patience and be ready to learn stuff because uh, understanding those is not a, is not a, a, a weekend project. Oh, and, and a lot of coffee and something else that keeps you awake. Um, uh, yeah, in the meantime, there's there's this site we that was started bef like a long time ago that collects oopses and grades them but how many times they appeared then you need to have a user, you need to have a tool on your on your on your distribution that reports the oops to the to the site and uh apparently some guys at red hat are are resuscitating it so so you're going to be able to see uh whose code generated the highest amount of oopses and who's going to be blamed <laughs> um so I decided, yeah, well, there are so many oopses. I mean, you can watch them on the side, uh, on, 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 on this site, on oops kernel work. But let's just do one ourselves. So what this does is uh, we read an MSR, which is non-existent. It's called dead beef. And this MSR doesn't exist on any x86 CPU, which means if you read an non-existent MSR, you're going to get a GP, which is a general protection fault. And this is what happens. This is how it looks like. And this is the whole oops. The whole text. Oh yeah, by the way, so when 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 you report oopses and kernel people say send me the whole oops, it has to have everything. It has to have the rip, has to have the register snapshot and stuff. But I'm gonna explain everything. Right, and let's start. The first the first line generally explains why did we oops. So it says general protection fault, and there's the error code, and the thing in a, in, a, in, a, in a bracket says how many times we died already. So how many times it generated an oops. So this is the first oops on the machine. When, it's, when it has a bigger number, means you had an oops before, which means if you see an oops like that, where the counter is higher than one, you probably want to see the first oops, which caused the subsequent oopses. And you don't want to watch the second ones. And um, Afterwards, our flags means it's a preemptible kernel and it's an SMP kernel. All right. Uh, the next line, the next line shows which modules were linked in. I mean, this is important. For example, to know whether I mean the the, the best example is am I am I running a system that has proprietary modules which 
are written by some entity outside of the upstream development and they're using all interfaces and in the meantime the interfaces changed and they did some backporting and stuff like that and uh, generally when you see that when you see a proprietary module it's going to say module name and then a big p after the name in brackets which means this module is proprietary and and and, and kernel people say well you have proprietary modules try to reproduce it without it the the simple reason is Proprietary module is closed source. You cannot look at the code. You cannot help, and you cannot say what's going on there. So, why even waste the time? And there's there there are other there are other uh, um, module markers like crap, which is modules from the staging tree, and uh, forced unload means when you unloaded a module like did rm mod minus f, unload unloaded forcefully, even even if the module uh, has some resources which are pent and you cannot unload it normally and if you force unload it then you cause some some in not normal condition and then your system is going to become unstable by definition oh and the ot is out of tree module the next line says um on which cpu this happened which user space process was running on that cpu at the time and what was the name of the process so swapper is the is the is the 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 idle process on each CPU and backslash like sl slash zero means CPU zero. So the swapper thread on CPU zero is running. So the thing is is idle and not tainted means so nothing out of the ordinary has been loaded on the machine. And these are all the taint flags, which can which okay. Wh what is tainted? So tainted means that the kernel is not as in its pristine form where you can be sure that there are no corruptions and the, the source is still consistent so you can you can execute in in its tested form for example if you if you load a proprietary module you tend the kernel because you change stuff you don't know what changes for example other example is if you have a machine check means the machine is unstable there's a hardware problem there's a software problem the kernel is also tainted it means the kernel cannot guarantee anymore for its performance for for its execution that that's what it means uh roughly so not tainted means everything is still fine and uh afterwards is the kernel release the plus sign means this is the ba the tag the rc3 tag plus some patches unknown amount of ton of patches so when you look at this and say you know okay so is this the RC3 kernel or you added some patches on top and which are those patches and stuff like that? And uh, the last number, number two, it means the, the source tree which you use to build a kernel. Uh, uh, so the kernel is built twice for the second time. That's the second built from the same source tree without doing a make, make master proper. So clean the source tree. All right. Next is uh, it shows the hardware name. This is this. I mean, I run this on KVM, so this is the this is the DMI strings KVM generates. Basically, it's an architectural specific system identifier on, on x86. It's it's the DMI string, which is set some sometime early in the boot. And 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 by the way, DMI sucks. This is on one of my other machines. It says to be filled by OEM and stuff. This is supposed to help. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe one of the good thing is the good things is that shows the BIOS versions. So if you're debugging a hardware, if you if you're debugging a hardware issue and the BIOS is pretty old, you probably want to say, well, you might want to update your BIOS. And this is what the strings. This is why the BIOS is there for. But not every not every manufacturer puts it there. So you could just say, I don't know, something. It might not be helpful. Right. Next line. Um, this is um, still connected to the to the to the process that's running on the CPU at the time the whoops happens. This is the task, which is a is a virtual address that a pointer to the test struct of this process that's running. And uh, which is actually current. So current is a variable that points to the current process on that CPU that's running. And uh, there's afterwards there's thread info and thread info that's that's x86 specific I think. I don't know what the other architectures do, but thread info is is a way to get to the to some important, uh, like like 
preempt count and stuff from the stack. And this is on the stack on x86, and this is this TI gives you the pointer to the to the thread info. And there's also a task thread info, which could be different. That's why we dump both. Just to make sure that yeah, they're the same. And this is maybe the most one of the most important parts. This is the RIP, the instruction pointer. So when the oops happened, the instruction pointer was pointing to this virtual address. And this is the first address, the FFF 153A. So when we started, when the oops, like when, when the fault happened, like the protection fault happened, the, R, the RIP was pointing to that address. And this is important because when you know what's on this address, you know on which instruction the machine, uh, the, the fault happened. So maybe the instruction on this address caused the fault. So this is just, you know, this is just a first observation you can do. And then, uh, yeah, so the 0010 at the front, that's the, that's, the, that's the code segment. That's something on x86 code segmentation. I mean, the oops is on 64-bit, which means there's a limited segmentation, and there's the code segment which you use, and this is the kernel code segment. I mean, it's, it's a long story. <laughs> And then at the end, this is a help, a, a, a kind of a help that says it happens in a function init AMD, and uh, it the rip points so many bytes after the start of the function. That's the one A thing. So init AMD also is also a, an address, right? And it inside that function you go 1a bytes, and this is where the rip is. So for example, if you do some arithmetic and, and subtract the rip from 1a, you're going to get the address address of init AMD of the function itself, and stuff like that. And then at the end, it shows you how big the whole function is in, in binary code, so 600, 640 in hex. And uh, this um, init AMD string comes from k sims. so this is a a way to link all the f kernel function names, like the strings, into the kernel as an image, and they're compressed. And then, when you when you print, when you do when you do a print k with this speci specific format, small p and big b, it does a lookup lookup with this as print backtrace, does a lookup into k all sims and gives you the uh, the name of the function. If you don't have k all sims built into the kernel, you're just going to see an address. And if you see an address, what you can do then, you need the kernel image, the ready built kernel image, to object dump it and find the address and try to guess from that address what what code is that, where does it come from. And if you have KL sims, you just know this is the function, just go look it up the function. That's why, that's the main reason for KL sims. And then you see the register snapshot. I mean, every architecture has a different set of registers. This is, I mean, if you see R15, for example, you know it's a 64-bit, right? On 32-bit, you don't have R15. You don't have the extension registers. And um, if you know a little bit about, about read MSR, the instruction, it, the, the MSR, the address of the MSR you try and read is put in the RCX register. So when you see the register dump, it says, in RCX, there's the register name, the register uh, address I'm trying to read. So this is another help when you look at this and say, okay, RCX has a dead beef, so I'm trying to read some register. But we're going to see later that that I'm, I'm, uh, we're really doing a read MSR. And uh, all right, until here, this is clear, right? This is the register snapshot. Then you have the segmentation registers, FS and GS, and on 64-bit, uh, this is the beginning of the uh, per CPU area. And we save this in GS, in the, in, in the GS register. And this is, that's why we dump it here. And what those things mean is this is the secret, this is the hidden portion of the FS register and this is the hidden portion of the GS register. And these are the contents of the FS and GS registers themselves. Oh, well, this could help sometimes. I mean, it's not, I mean, FS, I don't know. We probably don't need it that much, but for GS, if you're, if you're debugging some issue with the per CPU variables, you probably want to know where the per CPU uh, data area starts. This thing is called kernel GS, and this is uh, x86, this 64-bit specific. When we enter kernel space, we can execute an instruction called swap GS. So 
Um, in order to be able to access fast, to access fast kernel data structures, you can execute this instruction and it swaps the contents of the GS register with an MSR register. So for example, if, you, if you're in user space, uh, the GS says something. And if you enter kernel space, it swaps, it swaps the per CPU data. So whenever you're in kernel space, whenever you do a syscall, uh, you can be sure that you already have the per CPU uh, data area set up in GS, and this is what swap GS does. We do, we do this every time we enter the kernel on, on syscalls, for example. And uh, here, at the last line, these are the control registers on, on, on x86, for example. You can see from there stuff like no, no, no. right, yeah. So, for example, the this this nibble, it has the machine the the machine check bit there and the page size extension stuff like that. Basically, it looks like this. This is uh, this is from the AMD architecture manual, and this is the this is a definition of CR4. So when they, when you look at that data, the next thing you do, you open the manual and look at all the bit definitions. It might have something important there, and yeah. So yeah, when you debug, oh, oops, oops, it's like that. You have to have a bunch of manuals open all the time on your desk. <laughs> right, and then. Um, I mean, we saw we saw where the rip is, right? The rip is, the rip is at this address, 15 AAA. So we have the kernel source tree, and oh, okay, we saw it's an init AMD function, right? And it's, and we go and object dump it and see, okay. This is how the function looks. This is just the beginning. And there's dead beef, okay. This is a so we put dead beef in ECX, so. I mean, in the oops, in the in the in the register snapshot, we we show we saw that beef is in ECX. So an another another hint, another sign. What what else do we see? I mean, when 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 you when you the the 64-bit Abby specifies that when you call a function, you have to put put all these register RBP R13 R12 on the stack, and this is what happens. Yeah. Oh, you you object dump. So so you have to know which C file contains the function, right? So when you build the kernel, it produces object files of all the files, of all the C files you enabled for compilation. So basically, you do object dump, archx86, blah blah blah, amd.o. This is the file that contains init amd, and and you do the same with every other function. You just have to know where the function in which file it is defined. So when you do that, you see this code. And, and the interesting thing is those addresses are, are relative addresses. And the addresses you see in the kernel image, they're absolute addresses. So you have to pay attention to stuff like that. And, um, and then you see, for example, normally you see push, move, push, move, uh, stuff like that. And you see the move here. And this is compiler optimization because it decided to do the move in the first first three or four instruction because this gets executed as a group and this gets to execute before that so there's no pipeline install and stuff like that so this is very low level but yeah in case you're wondering why this happens then then comes the stack and this is the stack the kernel stack at the time the fault happened so it just basically goes over iterates over the stack Starts with a st stack pointer and iterates until thread size minus one, which is two 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 pages. This eight k st stack process stack, and we walk the stack only in kernel mode because if you walk it in user space, the stack might not be met because the process which has been running might get paged off, and we get a page fault while executing a an a, an oops and a and a and a fault, and then that's a double fault, and then the machine restarts. And there's a marker, for example, if if this happens on 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 in the interrupt handler, there's a marker that says EOI that says until here, this is the interrupt stack and then the process stack. So this is the EOI marker that says that. Right. And then there's the call trace, and this is this is also very important help because it shows how we ended up at this rip, 
how we came to here. So basically, if you watch this, it's, you see that this is the first function on the stack, and this function at this offset called this function, then this function executed until here, and it called this function. No, no, wait a minute, there's a question mark, which means this function is still on the stack, but it's not on the cur current stack frame, so it has been called sometime, then we, 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 we return, and then we call a different function. So maybe this function called repair environment string at some point, but then return, and then it called start kernel. So this is how this, is how th uh, this happens. And then start kernel at this offset called checkbox, and then it then identify boot CPU, and identify CPU at that offset called init AMD. So this is how it happened. And right, and the same thing here when you when when you fault and when you oops in in a in a in a when you're in an exception or an interrupt, you first iterate over the exception stack, then you dump the interrupt stack, and then the process stack. So you, because because on next on 64-bit we have multiple stacks, and whenever we, for example, when you when you see an exception, we switch the stacks from the process stack to the to the to the um, exception stack, and when there's an interrupt, we run it on the interrupt stack and stuff like that. Right, and then 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 the code comes. So the code is dump is an uh, is is dump of the raw instruction stream. So this is what the rip is, is pointing. Uh, so this is where the rip points to. This is the marker, and we start at at couple of bytes before that, and after that we dump we dump that that whole instruction stream so that we can verify that it actually is the same instruction stream. That the that the 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 call trace pointed to, and yeah, and we dump it also only in kernel mode because in user space and that's a there's a there could be a problem. This points to the rip. That's the same instruction f, and there's a script in uh, in the kernel source tree that's called decode decode, and then you can feed that call to that script and 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 it can it can convert the binary the the raw binary into instructions. And just to compare, this is, this is okay. This is now this is an object dump of the uh, of the of the VM Linux of the whole linked kernel image, and uh, this is the address. I mean, this is we know this one already. So this is where the function starts. This is in init AMD where the function starts. This is the same code, like we saw it before, but the addresses are are. Um, um, uh, uh, yeah, virtual addresses of the link kernel. And uh, the rip pointed to 15 AAA. And that's the instruction opcode, and it's 0F32. And if you look there, we have also 0F32. So this looks reliable. It must be the same code, you know? And if we count, if you count the bytes backwards, it's going to be the same. So there's 28, there's EC, and if you look up, uh, it's also 28 EC. So it's probably the same instruction stream. Yeah. Uh, the question is, how does it decide how much of the code is? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it starts at some point. More questions? Okay, I, I have this on a different, uh, so the question is how can you be sure whether this, is, was that a question, whether this is the real instruction stream and why you want to verify that? Yeah, for example, we do crazy stuff in the kernel called alternatives where we go and replace instructions in the ready-made uh, kernel image so that we run better. For example, if you offline all your CPUs but one, you switch to UP mode. When you switch to UP mode, all the spin locks can be rewritten into preempt disable. This is one example. So when you rewrite this, you cannot see this in the VM Linux image because the VM Linux image doesn't have the patched instructions. Only the image in memory has those. So for example, if you run it, if you run the kernel on KVM and you 
and you boot the kernel and you object dump the kernel memory from, from the guest, you're going to see the difference. You know, because we patch those instructions during boot at the beginning. We just re rewrite them, we just mem copy. That's why. I mean, most of the cases, it, it's, it's the same. Most of the cases, I mean, yeah, but in very seldom cases, you just want to verify whether this, whether the code is actually, <coughs> whether the code you're executing is actually the code you're looking at in the, in the built kernel image. That's a yeah. That's that's a different aspect. For example, when you when you look at oops from somebody who built it with compiler X and Y, and you don't have that compiler, you're probably going to want to see his VM Linux image because if you build the same VM Linux with the same config from him, you're probably going to generate different code. You know, because uh, you cannot control how the compiler does register allocation and stuff like that. I mean, it could be different. He could be doing push, he could be doing move, whatever the compiler said. So, yeah. So it's, yeah, you have to have the exact same environment used to build the kernel in order to debug the image locally. Or if you don't have that, you probably want to have access to the, to the user's VM Linux file. Or, or ask them to do stuff. Ask an object them this and do that. It's solely based on the kernel. Uh, kind of, you know, you're you're you know, Just based on the kernel. Oops, recovered the image, the whole kernel image. It depends on on what config options you have enabled. You can re, re, you can regenerate the kernel version. Let me show you. For example, here, this, the plus thing. There's a there's a there's an option in kconfig where you can say that you want to add, if possible, the git commit ID to the back of the kernel name, which has been used to build the kernel. If you enable that option, it's going to have the git commit ID. So when you have the git commit ID, you have the source. You have a snapshot of the source. But still, you have to have the same environment which has been used to build the kernel, like the compiler of the user and the user space. Yeah. So you, cannot, you can recover some parts of it, but not all. But you cannot guarantee. You cannot guarantee. But for example, most of the time, you know, I mean, if you know which function it is, and you look at the user code, uh, if you object dump the, 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 the code that the user, and if you object dump, let me show this. So this is the output of scripts decode code. There's some garbage at the beginning, and then, and then you, we can recognize we can recognize the same code here, and the read MSR. So if you if you if you don't have the user if you don't have the VM Linux of the user, but you build the kernel locally, you're probably gonna have this, this very similar register usage, and you're probably gonna have R13 here. For example, because R12 or R13 are both saved from a uh, Coli saved, so you probably the other compiler decided to use R13. So it's going to be different, but you're still going to recognize what happens. So if you if you can see that, I mean, it's it's a lot of it's a bit guesswork, right? If you can see that, and you can be pretty sure that this is this is the same snapshot you're you're watching locally as you got from the user from the reporter, and you can reproduce the bug locally. And then you try your fix, and it fixes it. It's probably the fix, <laughs> but but not always. Yeah, this is why Elena says you need five years five years of experience. <laughs> I mean, it's just yeah. Right. So t you take you take yeah. So you have the oops, and you can feed it into scripts decode code, and then you see the the instruction names from the binary opcodes. And even shows you on which instruction we're trapped. And then you go, okay, this is read MSR. And we have in RCX a register, uh, MSR register called dead beef. And this register doesn't exist. So I'm probably reading a non existent register. And this is the problem. So at that point, you probably can, can do a conjecture and say, this might be the problem with, with, this, with this situation. 
But as, as, again, I mean, there can be compiler optimizations. You, you probably might not recognize the code the compiler generated because you optimized the hell out of it. Or we can do alternative patching. Or if rip, rips point into, into module space, you don't know which module is, it is. I mean, you can, but it's, it's not that easy. So what you also can do is you can generate the assembly output of, of that file. So you know amd.c contains, contains the function where rip points to. And you do make blah, 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 dot s. And it generates the assembly output. And if you look at the assembly output, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff the compiler generates. And there's the dead beef. But it's in decimal. So you're pretty sure, yeah, this is the. This is the same code I'm looking at, and there's the, where's the read, there's the read MSR, and there's there's also another another help, that's called make blah 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 list, and it interleaves C code with assembly, with object dump output, so that you can verify what happens, and after you know all these, after you've seen all that, and you're pretty sure that you have a you have a you have a coherent view of the issue. You can think of a fix now. I mean, one of the big mistakes is just oh yeah, I found the fix and I think I found the fix. You rush it, and then uh, it fixes the issue on three machines and breaks other three. So yeah, just make sure to understand exactly what happens. And after you understood that, then you probably have a good idea about the fix. You patch it, build it, test it in KVM if possible. That's very very easy, very fast to test stuff in KVM. And send it out, and if it's already upstream, you see stable, the stable kernel, so that it gets backported to stable. Or you can do live fixes with splice, with case splice, which is like binary patching of the running kernel image, which is even crazier. As I said, further info, documentation, loop tracing, uh, Linux device drivers. The book has an interesting chapter on debugging techniques. You can ask on LKML, you even pester people, say, this is your code, and it breaks on my machine. How can I help you to debug it? I can give you all the information you need. And yeah, you need all the procession manuals and specs, depending on, or not only procession manuals, but the manuals, depending on what kind of bug you're, you're trying to fix. That's it. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> we have about uh, 40 people looking at, at the video, the, the live stream, so we need to hear the, the question. Okay, so the first one I got is um, what's, what kind of information you're trying to recover from that kind of, because we know it's all very complicated and too concise, maybe. And the second one is uh, what's in the general practice you, you take to, uh, to debug? Say that you use GDB, you're trying to sort of uh, disassemble the code sleep and try to associate new things with uh, the source code. What kind of, uh, do you have uh, like a general process to, to approach to debug with the kernel OOPS? OK, um, the f uh, let me answer the second question <laughs> first. So uh, basically, if you take your time and, and patience and look at all these all that information there and analyze the, the code and, let, and you know what you know the code stream, you know how the code flows, most of the time you understand what the problem is. You know most of the time you just know. I mean if, if, it's, a, if, it's, a, if it's a null pointer exception, you're going to see that it does, for example, move register something and the register that uses as a source is zero so you know okay it's a, then you see it's a no pointer it's an uh, the value so you try to track back which value of all the variables in this register is zero and then you look at the source code and um and you you try to understand why the the value like the, the variable name or, or pointer or whatever is zero but there's not there's no one single uh, 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 how to how to fix stuff like that? You just have to bring a lot of patience. Try to understand it. That's why. That's why. I mean, a lot of newbies ask how how to how to get involved in the kernel development, 
and they they start the easiest thing like white space cleanup and stuff uh, this is this is maybe fun for a while but after a while it gets annoying because yeah for different reasons but if you really want to get involved in this you just bring a lot of patients coffee and try to fix a bug trying to understand the code but uh, again there's no there's no single recipe kernel recipe how to how to how to fix a bug i mean you try the best the first thing you have to do is try to understand the situation completely once you understood it you probably have an idea how to fix it but yeah never 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 just understand it a little bit and then come come up with a brown paperback which is even worse what was this, the first question so among all the information you got in you know, mm -hmm. kernels what is the most uh, helpful and most of the time you get some hint you get some clue about how to debug things. Like, uh, I'm sure that uh, the value of the register was not so helpful, generally. But uh, what about, like, the, the code? Well, the, the most, yeah. I mean, best thing is to have the whole information, the whole snapshot. I mean, sure. it's not, it's, uh, you have exactly the information you need and not more. You, you know? don't need more information from kernel. That's, that's, that should suffice in most of the cases. You know, okay. so yeah, you need all the information. You need the rip. You need, for example, if it's if you're looking at assembly, you want to know what the registers contained at the time the oops happened. So you want to have all registers. But yeah, the rip is most important. So you know where to start, where you start looking. Then you start looking in the code, and you see, okay, it's not as easy as this one, right? At this one, you just look at RCX. That beef is there. Okay, we're reading a non-existent MSR, and it's a general protection fault. Then it has to be general protection fault because we're reading on a non-existent MSR. But in the other cases, you probably want to look at a couple of registers in the snapshot. And maybe if you're using the stack, you probably want to look at the stack too. And then you probably want to look at what modes the processor was. So you need the control registers. And if it's a per CPU stuff, you probably want to look at the GS register. And yeah, I mean, everything is needed. You cannot say, I need only one. Some parts though, actually this is maybe the minimal, the minimum snapshot information you can get, just debugging issue. And maybe that's not even enough in some cases. Mm. Sorry, another one. Um, well, you have the machine code, mm -hmm. so how could you associate that? How could you sort of, uh, you know, trying to pinpoint uh, the fanning code, trying to, because you, you got all those instructions, all those offset, it's, it's mm -hmm. in, in machine code. Yeah. But you look at uh, in the source code, it's in different uh, representation. How could you, did you use GDB to, to do that? Or? Well, you, you, you know where it happens, init AMD plus 1A offset, right? So. Okay, let's let's just try yeah, one. Yeah, but then it's that's machine code. Yeah, yeah, sure. But we go and we look at the that's the object dump of the file itself of the of the amd.o. That's not even the kernel image. That's the one file that's been compiled. You just looked up that init amd is in that file. So, you look at the at the address of init amd and that's 3e0 and the offset from the rip was 1a. Then you do a little math and say 3e0 plus 1a is how much? 3FA. And this is the rip. So this is the instruction that caused it. OK, so you do that manually. You do this um, sort of mapping calculation. Yes, yes. That's basically it. And then you object dump the, the, uh, uh, the, the code stream from the oops to verify that, that, that actually, that's actually the case. And you see the same instructions. And this thing points to the same instruction. OK, so okay, okay this is it. This is the instruction. This is how you approach it. One possible way. So the OOPS is giving you information about one particular process. Um, if you have a concurrency problem, then maybe a bad thing happened in one process, and then it's sort of a reaction in the process that actually crashed. So are the, do you find the OOPS is useful in that case in any, any way, or? Is is it a is it something that are many of the problems that you have to react to concurrency problems? Well, um, if you if something caused another process to oops, and you cannot reproduce why it oops, the oops is of little help. 
I mean, that's why I, I, I talk about patience, because you have to try to imagine what happened before that. So it's a, a lot of guesswork and a lot of testing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was thinking of a case where you have a variable, and it's a shared variable, mm -hmm. and, and one thread sets it to null, and the other thread tries to dereference it. So you have a null pointer dereference, but there's no explicit assignment to null in that thre in the code of that thread. That's very hard. So, to, that's okay. very hard to debug. Okay, so you just have to do other things. The oops well, is not very helpful. Well, for processor the designers they use they can do traces of the whole core execution core uh, mm -hmm. for. A, I don't know, 3 million instructions, 30 billion instructions. And they can see stuff like that, but you need to dump the traces from every core. I mean, how do you reproduce that in, in a clean environment? I mean, concurrency bugs is like one of the craziest bugs there. So is that what percentage are concurrency bugs of the things that you look at? Uh, me? I try not to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how often uh, do you come to the conclusion that you are facing a hardware issue, some uh, memory corruption, for example, or such things? Yeah, we were talking about this before with, with Olivier. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, you can never know for sure that it's, that it's a, when it's a hardware issue, that it's a hardware issue. I mean, for example, sometimes, right, so the machine check architecture on x86 th is basically a bunch of asserts in hardware that verify the state of the machine that it, while it executes and says this has to be this and this has to be that and if it's not that then I'm going to raise a machine check and I'm going to stop the whole execution. This is built in there. But this is not a, this is not everywhere. I mean, you can have protection like ECC protection for cache structures. So when you write a cache line into the cache and you read it back out, it gets verified whether you read the right thing. So when you when you, when you get a machine check there you know, right? I mean, hardware problem. But if you don't have a hardware problem, uh, if you don't get an, uh, uh, if the machine doesn't tell you there's a problem, you probably, I mean, what I've seen is you try to analyze the bug and you look at the code and, and, and you think to yourself, this can never happen. Exactly. So, I mean, sometimes if you, if you, if you, if you also have a dump of the memory and there's a memory corruption, you're probably going to see this. But um, hardware, hardware bugs are very hard to trigger. Uh, very hard to debug. Yes, but um, my question was about the ratio of uh, such bugs that you consider uh, that are, uh, they are impossible by the code, so uh, they should probably be hardware issues. For example, I'm sure that you have been facing some uh, case where people overclock their uh, CPU and uh, you can have some bit flips in some registers uh, from time to time, yeah. um, such issues, but um, I, I don't know how often this, uh, this happens, in fact. Oh, it, well, it happens very seldom. But it happens once, twice a year. Depends. That, I don't know. Okay. Not anymore. I mean, it used to happen. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No more question. Okay. Thank you, Boris Love. Okay.